Welcome to today's true crime podcast. This is Crime Tales. Please take a minute to like and subscribe to my channel. I upload new content weekly. Today's story is about James Parker and Robert Tullock. Aged just 16 and 17, James Parker and Robert Tullock would go on to murder two prominent college professors on January the 27th, 2001. Bored with their life in Vermont, they cooked up a plan to go to California, but they needed money to fund their trip. They decided the only way to raise $10,000 quickly would be to steal it from somewhere or someone. They hatched their plan, bought themselves some weapons in case they would run into trouble, and off they went to wreak havoc on the lives of two innocent people who were so innocent, they truly didn't deserve what happened to them. They randomly chose the house of two college professors, Suzanne and Half Zantop. They posed as students, they created a fake questionnaire explaining that they needed it for their studies. Suzanne and Half, being college professors, happily let them into their home. They were happy to help them. Robert and James didn't exactly plan this out very well. This became apparent once they sat down in Half's study and he began asking them questions to discover what this was all about. Suzanne was in the kitchen, she was preparing a lunchtime snack and as discussions went on, it soon became apparent that the boys were not properly prepared for the task in hand. And this irritated Half, he was slightly exasperated by the boys and quickly the atmosphere changed. Feeling anger and impatience, Robert Tullock took out his knife, and when Half's back was turned, he stabbed him repeatedly. Half's wife, Suzanne, heard the commotion and came running into the study. Tullock shouted for James to get her, and as she got to the study door, he took out his knife and attacked her. Both victims received numerous stab wounds, and Tullock and Parker carried out a frenzied attack. Not knowing what to do, and as their robbery had clearly not gone to plan, they hurriedly took Half's wallet and exited the house quickly. So what do we know about the victims, Half and Suzanne Zantop? Well, Half met Suzanne while they were both studying at Stanford University. This was in the mid-1960s. They were both from Germany originally, and fascinated with geology. Half earned a bachelor's degree, while Suzanne was working on her master's degree in political science. After he earned a PhD in geology in 1969 at Stanford, Half later worked as a field geologist, and he and Suzanne were married in 1970. They had two daughters, Veronica and Mariana. Suzanne taught German at Dartmouth College, situated in the rural town of Hanover, New Hampshire. She was actually chair of the German Studies Programme, and Half, he taught geology, and was an earth science professor, and was very popular amongst his students. And in 2000, shortly before their deaths, they'd begun discussing retirement in the very near future. So how were the murders discovered? The Zantops were actually due to entertain a colleague that evening at 6.30. She arrived at the scheduled time, knocked on the door, but received no answer. Thinking this odd, she tried the front door and found it was open, so she made her way in. She looked around the home but found nothing out of the ordinary, but there was no sign of her friends. She shouted out for them, but received no answer. She made her way down to the study, where she was met with a scene of horrific proportions. For a few seconds she was trying to take in what she'd seen. The room was in absolute disarray. There was blood everywhere, and the bodies of the Xantops were laying on the floor, covered in blood. They both looked to be deceased. She stepped back out of the room, left the house and immediately called the police. The police arrive on scene. Seven minutes after receiving the distressing call from their friend Carol, a detective arrives on the scene. The detective had been informed en route to expect two deceased bodies on his arrival and when he gets there, Carol, who made the 911 call, informs him of what she'd found the bodies of two prominent law professors, both seemingly murdered. Upon entering the house, the detective finds the house undisturbed. He takes a patrol sergeant with him to survey the whole of the house first, 
to ensure the house is empty and that the killers have left the scene. When entering the study, his breath is taken away at what he sees. In all of his law enforcement career, he's never seen anything quite like it. He also has a military background and still he can't believe what he's seeing. The scene was horrific, bloody, grisly and gruesome. At this point, he can't tell what has actually happened. Was it a murder-suicide? Was it a murder? He couldn't tell. On reviewing the scene, it looked like the Xantops were in the middle of preparing a lunch rather than a dinner, so this put their time of death as being early afternoon. While investigating the scene, the detective could see that the house was a treasure trove of stuff everywhere, so at this point, it was impossible to determine a motive or if anything had been stolen. He secures the scene, cordons off the bodies, before leaving the site for the crime scene analyst to take over. The Police Investigation The Hanover Police Department is a small local police department, so they bring in additional resources from the major crimes unit of a nearby state police. They have experience with larger-scale murders and have the much-needed expertise to handle this case, given the horrific nature and magnitude of the murder in the crime scene. As they investigate the scene, they find Suzanne's body just outside the study, and Half was inside the study. There was an upturned chair near his body, and two other chairs were set up near the desk, which made it look like a meeting had taken place in the room with two other participants. This looked very odd. They discover blood droppings and a bloody boot print near the fireplace, and near the two chairs, the police make a chilling discovery. Two knife sheaths. Tactical style, 9 to 10 inches in length, both identical. Police assume at this point that they could belong to two knives and could possibly be the murder weapons. So does this mean there were two killers, two chairs, two visitors? They follow the blood trail to the front door. They find the front door unlocked with no signs of forced entry. So did the Xantops invite the killers into the house? Is this someone known to the Xantops? This whole scene raises so many questions. Suzanne and Half were popular people, beloved college professors, who seemingly had no enemies. Due to the number of stab wounds to both of them, it was initially thought it could be a crime of passion, as there was an essence of overkill due to the pure number of stab wounds. Suzanne had been stabbed 11 times and Half 10 times, and both had their throats slashed. The level of violence seemed so personal in nature the police speculated that whoever committed the murder would need to leave town immediately. So they checked the local airport, bus stations, cab companies to find any suspicious activity that may coincide with the time of the murders. They discover a local student who'd left the city on the night of the murders after midnight, which was very late. His friend said he'd left very quickly. This was a great lead, but on further investigation, they discover he'd left for a family emergency and was not connected to the Xantops or indeed the murder. The Xantops had so many friends, work colleagues and not to mention the number of students they taught. Police detectives head to the college where Suzanne and Half worked in order to learn all they could about the victims. They also reached out to the wider community of neighbours, relatives and anyone who may have known them. The suspect pool was vast. The murders were so personal, it was difficult to believe the killers were strangers to them. During interviews, one student remembered an argument between Half and one of his students. It seemed very heated, and he clearly wasn't happy with his professor. This happened just a few days before the murders, and he quickly became a person of interest. The students spoke Spanish to Half, so those who witnessed the argument couldn't decipher what the argument was actually about but it was enough to pique the police's interest and they brought him in for questioning. Not only did they discover he owns a large knife collection, but he was also sporting a large cut on his forehead. The police immediately think they have their man. The student was defensive during questioning and insisted his discussion with, with the professor was not heated at all. In fact, they were both laughing. After looking into his background and movements, they very quickly realised he had a solid alibi during the time of the murders. 
He could not be their suspect. The investigation carries on. They also find a work colleague who had a grudge against Half, but he also had a strong alibi and was discounted very early. They go back through the forensics to determine if they can reduce the suspect pool even more. They conclude very quickly that the knife sheaths were their best form of evidence. If they can find the owners of the knives, perhaps they may be able to apprehend the killers. The sheaths themselves also contain fingerprints, but having put the prints through their police investigation tools, sadly no match is received. The killer is not in their database. The next best clue is the footprint evidence. After eliminating all other footwear samples from anyone else who attended the scene, they suspect that the boot print does indeed belong to one of the killers. They use this image and contact the FBI who determined the brand is an expensive hiking boot. It's a great clue, but only useful if they can find an actual suspect for matching. Meanwhile, a couple of supporting detectives are working on the leads related to retailers who may have sold the knives. They visit numerous stores and show pictures of the knives. They're large tactical paramilitary combat grade knives, not exactly the type of knives used by the general public every day. The knife sheath themselves were only produced for one specific type of blade, which helps them in the search. The knife manufacturer is able to produce a list of all authorised retailers, broken down by state. But this list is vast, and it also includes internet retailers. So if you can imagine, this extended to over 5,000 retailers across the USA and worldwide. A literal needle in a haystack. How were they ever going to tackle such volumes? They contact the FBI for help. The volume of leads the case received was overwhelming. The media coverage of such an horrific murder expanded the story, resulting in hundreds of leads which overwhelmed the detectives. Given the Zantops were from Germany originally, leads were coming in both locally and internationally, and they quickly realised they needed ongoing support from the FBI to help them make sense of the case and manage their vast workload. So along with the state and local police, the FBI joined the task force and they quickly began to organise their workload. The FBI deploy a rapid start computer system to track and make sense of the hundreds of leads. They also begin to break down the profile of the killers and the crime itself. They quickly agree that this was not a professional hit by any standard. Too many mistakes have been made, from the boot prints to the knife sheaths, fingerprints. It all pointed to an ill-planned attack where no known motive was apparent. It seems the murders were committed and the killer simply left the scene. The detectives turned to the criminal profilers within the FBI to see if they could gain more insight about the killers themselves. The Xantops were not your usual victims. They were clean-cut, not on any drugs not involved in any criminality. They were low-risk victims. They were killed in broad daylight on a Saturday afternoon and the murder weapon that was used was unsophisticated. If they were targeted, surely someone would bring a gun or even a silencer. Instead, the scene was bizarre, with two chairs set up in the study as if two visitors had called. With what they could understand, it seemed like they were dealing with two offenders and with the evidence left behind, they were edging towards the offenders being youthful and inexperienced. There was no forced entry, and it literally looked like the Xantops let in their killers. Later, this theory was boosted by the discovery of Half's wallet being missing. Their original thoughts that this could be some kind of thrill kill, and now they theorise this could simply be a burglary gone wrong. The FBI reappealed to the public breaking down the profile of the murder and possible offender profiles. More leads pile in, but law enforcement are still no closer to an arrest. They go back to the drawing board and back to the list of the knife retailers, and although this task is overwhelming, they realise they have no other option than to at least review the list and see what they can find. They come across a retailer who sells combat knives over the internet. On February the 14th, they contact that retailer in Massachusetts. 
two knives had been purchased by someone less than 20 miles away from the crime scene. Thinking this was a good lead, investigators follow up immediately. Two troopers arrive at the house of James Parker. Attending the address, the police were surprised to find that the subject was actually a juvenile. He was only 16 years old. He told the police that he had purchased the knives for hiking, but quickly realised they were too big and sold them to an army and navy store. He'd originally purchased the knives for himself and a friend of his, Robert Tullock. The trooper felt something not right about his story and very quickly realised he may be talking to one of the killers. Parker is asked to attend the police station where he attends with his father and separately the police call upon 17-year-old Robert Tullock and his story also matches that of his friends exactly word for word. He's asked if he owns any walking boots and when he retrieves a pair of trainers and walking boots from his bedroom the detective is floored when he notices that one of the shoes is the exact same brand as a known boot print from the murder scene. With no arrest warrant in hand, the detective plays it cool and asks if Tullock will accompany him to the police station for fingerprinting and copies of his boot prints. He says yes, his mother attends with him, so he can't exactly refuse. Tullock and Parker have no prior criminal history and cooperate fully with the police detectives that night. They're both allowed to return home. The detectives quickly take the boot prints to the state police crime lab. The impressions are compared. In order to obtain a warrant, they need more proof than just suspicion. They also test the fingerprints and find a match to James Parker's fingerprints. And the boot prints also come back as a match to Robert Tullock. Both boys know the police are onto them. They make the decision to tell their parents they're staying at each other's houses that evening. But secretly they're planning on escaping. They are now fugitives on the run. So what do we know about the capture of Tullock and Parker? Well, the two teenagers are now on the loose. Forensic evidence has linked them to the case. And both parents are questioned. They have no idea where their sons are. The family members are devastated to hear their sons are suspects in such horrific murders. Investigators search the homes and to their shock they find the two knives in Tullock's bedroom. They exactly match the description of the murder weapons. They can't believe what they're seeing and it confirms Tullock and Parker are indeed the murderers. They quickly need to pursue them. Family members are devastated to hear their sons are suspects in such horrific murders. A be on the lookout is issued for the two teenagers and the car they're suspected of driving. Their pictures are posted all over TV, police and media outlets throughout the country. A state trooper finds an abandoned silver 1987 Audi at a truck stop and quickly, within minutes, he knows the car belongs to one of the subjects. A cafe employee at the truck stop remembers seeing two kids asking for a lift to California. A cafe employee at the truck stop remembers seeing two boys asking for a lift to California. Mass troopers check with cafes and pit stops along the route of the highway and quickly come across a husband and wife who'd given a lift to the boys. Using aliases, they'd been dropped off and were now in another truck heading up the highway. The FBI move fast and use radio dispatches to alert the truckers. They get news of another ride and it's clear they're heading west to California. A sheriff listening to the CB radio hears another trucker asking if anyone can give a lift to two boys heading to California. The sheriff answers the call but doesn't reveal that he in fact is a policeman. He calls for backup and reaches the location of the boys. At the truck stop, he asks the two boys for their names and where they're from, and they give fake names and details, and the sheriff soon realises he has his suspects. He quickly takes them into custody. They both come quietly. The arrest and the trial process. James Parker and Robert Tullock are brought back to the state of New Hampshire for processing. During a hearing, 
James Parker is certified to stand trial as an adult for the murders of Suzanne and Half Zantop. His attorneys offer testimony against his partner in crime, Robert Tullock, and ends up cooperating with the police. James Parker pleads guilty to a reduced charge, accomplice to second-degree murder. He is sentenced to 25 years in prison. Robert Tullock showed no sign of remorse for the murder, and in April 2002, he is charged with first-degree murder and is sentenced to life in prison with no parole. So what do we know about Tullock and Parker today? Well, both have had their sentences reviewed in recent years. In 2019, Parker asked for an early release from prison. His lawyer noted that while in prison, Parker had obtained a master's degree and had been a model prisoner. With a lot of resistance from the local community, particularly friends and family of the Zantops, Parker later withdrew his appeal and will remain in prison until at least 2024. Meanwhile, Tullock's case came under review after the Supreme Court ruled that mandatory sentence into life without parole was unconstitutional for minors. The New Hampshire Supreme Court ruled in 2014 that Tullock's case would be reviewed for resentencing. However, as of now, no hearing date has been set. Both Tullock and Parker are held at the New Hampshire State Prison for Men, where it's reported they have minimal contact. Not much is known about the boys, other than they both came from middle-class families. They both had sinister desires to commit a crime, and together they planned out the murder. The community to this day are doing everything possible to ensure the two remain in prison for good. Thank you for listening to this week's Crime Tales. Please like or subscribe to my channel and come back next week for a new crime tale.